Welcome to Working on Exploring. Um, this is a little bit different take on some of the things that I do. Um, recently I had a uh, an Instagram person reach out to me uh, about getting a dual alternator set up in his 2003 F350. Uh, that has a 7.3 liter diesel engine which is a different engine than mine but uh, regardless, we discussed the situation, what he wanted to do. He's got a Lance Camper with 500 amp hour lithium ion Battleborn batteries. And he had a 200 amp aftermarket alternator set up in his primary alternator position, but he was uh, unsatisfied with what he was getting. And he really wanted, felt the answer was what I had done, which was to have a standard alternator in a primary position supporting the vehicle and having a dedicated alternator in a second alternator position supporting just the camper. So that's what he wanted to do. We discussed it quite a bit. Uh, he got the parts together and I invited him to come over to my house and uh, stay here for a couple days while we did the modifications. In, the in preparing for this alternator installation, I reviewed a number of YouTube videos by some other uh, good quality uh, individuals who, who put together a very coherent package of how to install the the second alternator and uh, as we got into it one of the things that I found was that there was a fundamental problem with the location of the alternator relative to the tensioner. Uh, that being that the drive system was not going to work properly and this is where I also went back to some of the the videos I'd seen and 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 paid more attention to the trouble that some of these people who had installed the second alternator had, had. They were having uh, belt slippage and squealing problems and once I looked at the belt diagram I understood exactly why. Uh, they never appeared to have recognized exactly why and the problem is that the organization of the, the drive accessories and the tensioner is incorrect. Uh, Ford when they looks like they uh, designed the primary system and then after the fact tried to put a second alternator on there. Uh, the only place they had to put the alternator was the passenger side lower. Uh, once they put it there, put it behind the tensioner. Um, evidently they ignored this problem. Uh, the tensioner should have been relocated. Uh, probably too big of a problem for them. Uh, but anyway, um, in my opinion, the Ford stock configuration for the dual alternator system on a 7.3 is prone to having problems, uh, but it can be fixed. This is a belt routing diagram of the 7.3 liter engine with the basic uh, configuration. Uh, you can see the crankshaft here which produces the power that drives all the accessory drives, the water pump, the power steering pump, the primary alternator, the air conditioning compressor, and the belt tensioner here. So just uh, reviewing at some length uh, exactly how a accessory drive should work is the crankshaft rotates in a clockwise direction, uh, creating tension on the belt. And as you can see with my multicolors here, you can see that each of these uh, devices uh, requires belt tension to be produced by the crank in order to drive them. So coming right off the crank, we have belt tension supplied for all of the devices, in which case there's four here now. So the blue being the water pump uh, is driven, the green being the power steering pump is driven, the orange being the alternator is driven, and the purple uh, <coughs> being the uh, air conditioning compressor is driven. So the water pump, power steering pump, and alternator are always driven. The air conditioning compressor goes on and off. So this tension that's created by turning the air conditioner pump on is variable. It, it's either there or not there as the air conditioning compressor goes on and off. Uh, it's significant to note that when the air conditioning compressor is running, the tension in this uh, belt running over the alternator improves the traction on the alternator pulley. Uh, but when it's off, uh, you don't have any improvement in, t in tension. What you have is the tensioner, which is down here, uh, taking slack out of the belt, which creates some tension over the alternator. As you can see that this alternator only has about a 90 degree arc of contact with the belt, so it doesn't have the greatest traction um, of all the devices. If you can see most other devices within the accessory belt circuit all have almost 180 degrees of arc of contact where the alternator only has 90. So it has, and it also has the smallest pulley. So the, the actual 
region of contact is from here to here. And if you know, on a length, it's about an inch and a half. So it, it has the least amount of drive capacity of all the devices inward. At any rate, this is a fundamentally sound diagram uh, or arrangement in that when Ford created it, they understood that belt tension is, is drawn by each of these devices. And from the last device returning to the crankshaft, this portion of the belt is slack. And therefore, this is where the, the tensioner needs to be. Now, one of the things that Ford has done is they have upgraded this tensioner. Originally, this is, this is uh, the grooved pulley and this is the smooth pulley. Actually, I got it backwards. This is the grooved pulley. This is a smooth pulley. But the whole device pivots from this point right here. There used to be just one belt here, and now they have upgraded the tensioner to having a, a rotating two, two idler tensioner, which works very well. Um, and it's key to note that it is on the slack portion of the belt. There is no belt tension in this belt here other than that produced by the idler. And that's what makes this whole system work, is the tension in this belt augments the, the, the drive tension uh, that keeps the belt engaged over here. Each of these devices uh, consumes quite a bit of power, but this all works very well. Now that we've reviewed how the single alternator system works, this is the routing diagram for the dual alternator system. Everything else is in the same place. And now what we have is alternator two, which is located down here on the passenger side, lower portion of the engine. This is about the only location that's readily available to it. And this is where Ford decided to put it. They got all the brackets designed for it. Uh, idler number, this is an, an idler pulley right here. So this just reverses the path. And you notice that this alternator has much greater arc of contact than the primary does. Um, but it has, it has a fundamental problem is that this alternator is placed in the slack portion of the belt and it's placed behind the tensioner. And so to explain the problem that's created here, as this alternator switches on and begins drawing tension, that tension goes through this all the way back to the crankshaft, which is what drives it. And in this, by this creating tension, what it does is it unwinds the tensioner, creating slack in the belt. So you can see my big red arrows here. This is the position of force of the tensioner. And once this uh, belt goes under, under load, the, the counter, countering tension will pull the belt tensioner back. You'll notice where the two blue circles are. That's where I imagine as this tensioner rotates that it, it, it actually, it doesn't ever get to there. The, the, the tensioner is just going to slack just enough to cause slippage on this. And once it causes slippage on the alternator, you no longer, it loses tension in the belt and the idler uh, remains in a slightly slacked position. But this is the problem that exists for the 7.3 liter dual alternator system. The solution to it is to create more tension in the tensioner, which is by, by putting a shorter belt on here, these two black circles in their normal position is, are at a fairly relaxed state. But by putting a shorter belt on there, you'd rotate them back to where these two, bl two blue circles are, essentially winding up the spring in the tensioner to a much higher level, creating much more tension on the tensioner, which in turn resists the tension that this second alternator drive produces. Um, in our situation, we had lots and lots of slippage with a 137.7 inch belt. This pulley, he actually had a, uh, a overdrive pulley on there, which has a smaller diameter. The smaller diameter pulley creates increased tension over the standard diameter, which complicated the problem. The other complication is, is the slightly smaller diameter of this allowed this belt, this belt right, right here will actually bind on, will actually run over a, a, a cast aluminum boss on the, on the tensioner. And we did see some wear on it when we took the belt off to change it. So our solution again was to put a 135.9 inch belt on this thing, which cocks the, the tensioner back and that and we left the overdrive pulley on there. The overdrive pulley was a, a possible replacement to reduce belt tension, but uh, what we discovered is, is that it, it was not necessary once we were able to get a lot more tension out of the tensioner, and that solved the problem. Again, I think this will same thing can happen on a an E-series uh, vehicle. Um, just to note, this 
this alternator it was a standard. It was a large case, 135 amp, uh, large case, sixth generation Ford alternator. This is also a 6G alternator. In this case, this was a 200 amp alternator. And once we got all done with this, we were experiencing if the if the the five Battleborn batteries were at about a a 30% state of charge, this alternator would produce about 180 amps when it was cold, and it would definitely warm up its its continuous duty capacity is only about 100 amps. So if you start it cold, uh, pushing into 30% uh, state of charge uh, batteries, it's going to draw a lot of power. It's going to run 180 amps or more. Um, it's going to heat up the alternator. And we were using a Balmar MC618 uh, charging regulator, which is specifically designed to accept a a temperature gauge for the alternator. And once it senses that the, the alternator has uh, begun, has reached about 118 degrees centigrade, it begins backing off the charge duty cycle in order to reduce the, the charging and thereby reduce, reduce the heating of the alternator. And so we set the alternator charge regulator to a maximum of 128 centigrade, and it did a good job of keeping it below that number, but it would run in you know 120 degrees centigrade while batteries were at low state of charge. Anyway, this was a very effective um, solution for us. We're very happy that it, it worked out, but if you are a 7.3 owner with uh, dual alternators and you are having belt slippage, uh, this is the reason. The alternator should never be behind the tensioner. Should, all the drive accessories should be in front of the tensioner. Ford should have designed a tensioner to be located at this location and, and run this belt, belt straight down here and up and over the tensioner. That would have worked just fine, uh, but they didn't. And uh, I'm not going to go find a tensioner and design a way to get it on here. So our solution was 135.9 inch belt. Um, on my blog at Working on Exploring, I have a parts list for this uh alternator installation and on that parts list there is about seven or eight different part numbers of the same belt by different manufacturers so that's readily available so that's the summary there are no uh, videos of our installing this uh, drive we never imagined that we were going to have uh, the issue that we had so we never uh, decided to start with it again there are there are good videos for installing the the drive system on um, the, inter the internet on, on YouTube. Um, one other issue that uh, you may encounter is that installing a second alternator on a 7.3, the OEM configuration for controlling the alternator is to use the ECU to turn the alternator on and off. Uh, if you install the second alternator and in and doing so use the factory wiring configuration, you're going to have to take it to the dealer for them to reprogram the ECU to recognize the the second alternator. Uh, one of the reasons why I advise that it might be some, a better way not to do this is that the control strategy that Ford uses on dual alternator systems, this is dumb alternators. These are alternators before about you know 2012 or 2013. The, the standard alternator system creates problems with glow plugs in diesel engines. Glow plugs are rated at 11 volts. Um, having too much charging during the, the heating cycle of glow plugs, which is the first two minutes of engine start, will burn out glow plugs. So you do not want this alternator operating and pushing energy into your engine system while glow plugs are operating. The, the primary alternator alone will not overvolt the system, but adding a secondary alternator in there and charging and running it into the main system while the glow plugs are still operating will raise the voltage of the, of the engine system over 13 volts. It will burn out your glow plugs. So be careful how you control your alternator. In our situation, we chose to use um, this Balmar external regulator the secondary alternator was completely dedicated to charging the batteries in the camper. Uh, we ran a two gauge cable all the way to the camper batteries, um, which again, it, would, it will carry 180 amps. It's rated to carry 210 amps outside of engine spaces. 
Um, so it was a very capable system, but it was completely separate from the truck system. And I encourage you, if you're going to put a second alternator in there and intend to dedicate it to charging your, your camper batteries, this is a really good strategy to use rather than trying to combine it with your, your vehicle operating system. The, so the, the, the caution is Ford complicates problems of dual alternator installations by a different control scheme for the second alternator. Assuming you're having a diesel truck, um, which this is specifically talking about 7.3 liter and 7.3 liter and 6 liter share the same control schema that Ford developed, is that when you have a second alternator, that alternator is a backup. It is not run in parallel with your primary alternator. Uh, the ECU specifically controls the alternator to prevent it from charging during startup, to prevent over overvolting the, the engine system, which will overheat and burn out your glow plugs. The other thing that it does is that it operates based on system voltage. Only when your system voltage gets down to about 13.4 volts or so, I don't know exactly, will that second alternator become energized. So the ECU systems wants to force the primary alternator to generate to its maximum capacity and once it's at its maximum capacity the system voltage starts dropping down and at 13.4 volts the, the ECU says okay it's time to turn the second alternator on and only then does it actually begin to generate. So many of these people with secondary alternators see very little operation of their second alternator and they may or may not realize it but for this reason um, I encourage you, if you're planning on running your second alternator for your camper batteries, do not connect it through your engine uh, power system. Set it up with a second external regulator and charge your batteries directly. Um, this is going to be a much better solution for you. You're going to get much higher amperage. So if you were to power two alternators into your engine system and then run one or two DC to DC chargers off of it, which I know has been done, uh, you can get probably 80 to 100 amps of charge. Um, your concern should be that your, your system with DC to DC chargers does not have any alternator temperature sensing. You're going to be highly loading your alternators you do not know what temperature those alternators operate at. You do not know if you're over-tempering those alternators. So it is a open-loop control system that has uh, problems. If you were to do what we did, which was use a Balmar charging alternator with an alternator temperature sensing, you can be sure that your camper alternator is going to be under control and that your vehicle alternator is going to be under the no excessive load other than what the vehicle normally provides. So I think you have a very high surety of not having a breakdown.